this is the first week of a brand new series. I'm really excited about this. It's called Work It, as you can see, and we're going to learn about how God meets us in the marketplace of our lives and, and, and how he likes to use us, how he wants to use us to impact the world that we live in. So I've never done a series like this, and what's really exciting is we're going to do five weeks of messages on this topic, and then at the end, we're going to have a fusion panel of manifestors who are making a difference in the marketplace or trying to or struggling with that, and we're going to just kind of interview them about what that looks like and, and what they've maybe learned through this series. It's going to be, a, it's a, going to be an amazing, amazing cap off to the series. Now, uh, as you know, uh, well, maybe you don't know, I have had some, some jobs in the marketplace outside of the church world, but because my, I, I'm not as smart as most people in the marketplace, I just want to start simple. With this, with this message, okay? So I'm just going to start slow. I'm going to build because you're not going to see the immediate connection. So the first thing I'd like to say is that I like pie. That's my, that's my wow, that just died right there. So I like pie, you, and, and I, I'm, I mean like I really like pie. Like it's, it's my go-to dessert. I, I love cinnamon buns, but pie. In fact, my favorite cake is black forest cake because it's a cake that wishes it were more like pie. Because there's a layer of pie in the middle of the cake. So it's got this identity crisis thing. Even, even cake knows it should be pie. That's what, I, that's what I like to say. So the reason I brought up pie is because and Tom likes to use puns. And so I wanted to kind of continue that, that vein. Because, see, if we're going to talk about the marketplace, then we're talking about spreadsheets and... Pie charts. Okay, so now see how we're, we're easing you into this? We're easing you in. So if you're feeling a trigger warning already, I, I can't help you. <laughs> if, you're, if you're triggered by pie, um, refreshments are at the back, but here we go. So now I'm going to show you, I'm going to show you the world's most practical pie chart. How many of you have seen this graphic before? This is so good, right? <laughs> pie I have eaten, pie I have not eaten. My only question about this is why is there still pie uneaten? I don't, and why is it lemon meringue pie without the meringue? Come on. Or something, you, I could just, do, if you're going to do pie, do it right. Am I, do I, can I get a witness? Amen. Okay, thank you. So now, now I'm going to take you a little deeper because every single one of us actually, regardless of our faith position, whether we believe in Jesus, whether we don't believe in Jesus, whether you're new to church, whether you know the Bible, whether you've read the Bible or not, every single one of us are, part, are pie chart people. Do you know that? You might, you might not draw this on your fridge or anything, but all of us work with a kind of pie chart, and I'm going to explain this in a minute, especially those of us that work outside the home, okay? So here, you've got a pie, the most simplest, the simplest pie chart in the world is, is divided into your work life and your home life. Now, you might be going, what, the work life, that's way too much, or that's way too little. So some of you might be 70, 30 on the work side, or 60, 40, or I don't know how this works for you, but all of us somehow probably divide our lives up this way. Even if, even if, even if you're got a part-time job, well, then that's, that's part of this thing. And I, I want to say that if you're a student, that, that this is your job, <laughs> okay? So if you're going to school, this, this series is still for you because school is your job. I hate to break it to you, but it's the job that you do. It's like about the same amount of time per day. You do it five days a week. You kind of do the nine to five thing, sort of, and, and it's getting you ready for whatever job that you're going to do in the rest of your life. So, so this is what, when I say your work life, that's what I'm referring to. Now, of course, it's not this simple because we've got the entire pie right now divided by two different lives, your work life and your home life. But in reality, you still have to find room for your social life, right? And so, so I don't know what yours would be. Maybe you just, you're trying always to, to make the pie bigger. Maybe you're an introvert. And you're going, whoa, that looks like 15%. <laughs> Let's just like bring it in, bring it in. I don't know like where you're at on that. But, but if you're a church person, it gets even more complicated because then you've got your spiritual life. Right? Or we, call the, we talk about the Christian life. And of course, if you're a really good Christian, you don't just leave it there. You've got to divide the Christian life up into parts as well. And so then you've got your church life. You've got your prayer life. And we wonder why we're stressed. <laughs> because did you notice how these are phrased? Semantics, we talk about, oh, it's just semantics. I, this is my pet peeve, okay? When people say, that's just semantics. Do you know what semantics means? Meaning. That's what it is. That's just semantics. That's just meaning. 
We, mean, we use it to say it's meaningless when in fact it's real. The, w- the words we use betray how we actually think. Does it alarm you at all that we self-describe ourselves as living five, six, seven, twelve different lives? Not aspects of our life, but we actually carve it out into little pieces and then we wonder why we're stressed and we wonder why God doesn't get any traction because he doesn't see your prayer life and your work life and your home life. He sees your life. And has it ever occurred to you that the the strategy of the devil, Satan, who really does exist, if you haven't met him yet, you don't want to, but he's in your life. I, I guarantee it. His strategy is to divide and conquer This is what he does. He separates us. He comes between us and God, first of all. He comes between us and the people we love most. He comes between us and our calling. He he wedges himself between us and our friendships, our our work relationships, everything. He's dividing and conquering everything. And by parceling everything out into all these different lives, he's making us buy into that framework. What he's doing is he's ensuring that what God does in one aspect of our life doesn't trickle into the rest of our lives. So what I want to do today is, I, I, and I want to start off this series, we're going to talk about one of the most important divides, I think, that God is trying to heal in the church today. And if you're not a church person, you, I still want you to see this thing come together. I want you to see God's vision for what we're talking about. Now, it, if, how many of you are business owners in this room? Business owners? Okay, how many of you are employees? Keep your hands up with the business owners, everybody. Okay, how, and, and entrepreneurs, that kind of, great. But how many times have you heard someone say this? And they, they, I know what they're saying, and I, I know they mean well, but in, if you've grown up in church at all, have you ever heard anyone say this? The church is not a business, What's usually couched in that phrase is, so you just keep that business stuff out of here. Like, you you can do what you want to do in the business part of your life. You just don't let that, we don't do that sort of thing here. Right? All those business principles and all that stuff, that is not what the kingdom of God is about. That is not what the church is all about. And maybe in your inside voice, you wouldn't say this out loud, maybe you're in your inside voice, you would say something like, well, that's great because my business is none of your business. <laughs> so how about this? How about this? I won't tell you how to run the church and you don't tell me how to run your business. And what, what happens is, again, the enemy has come between these two incredibly important aspects not individual lives, but aspects of our life, and he drives this wedge. Again, school has nothing to do with it. You know, whatever it is, whatever your work life is, whatever that is, we, we put it into this separate box, we tape it up, we mail it off somewhere, and then we wonder why, again, why we feel so fragmented. Now, here's, here's I got good news for you, unless it's really bad news. That's, that's the only thing. I don't know, I don't know where you're at. If you're eager here, you're going to find this to be incredibly good news. It, 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 this might be bad news if you don't want get God to get a hold of your work life. So here, here, here's what happened. I was studying for this, this series, and I started looking at the parables of Jesus. Now, how many of you know what the parables are? You don't have to put your hand. The parables are analogies that Jesus uses in, in his life as he's preaching. And, and they're, it's like para alongside. So he tells, he uses an analogy that's like something in our life so that we can see parallels, that's why it's called a parable, to our own lives. And we can see what God wants for us. And most of the parables start with a phrase that goes something like this. The kingdom of heaven is like... Or the kingdom of God is like. So what's, what, what Jesus is doing is he's saying, here's how I want you to see my kingdom. Here's how I want you to see my activity in the world. I'm going to give you a metaphor. It's not perfect. It falls apart at some point if you push it too far. But these are images that God gives us that help us understand how to see this nebulous part of our life, maybe that we call work, and and home, and how how do we bring all of this together under something that he calls his kingdom? So the kingdom of heaven is like. Now, depending on who you talk to, there are 22 or 23 of these parables in the New Testament. 
okay? 22 or 23 of them. I, I, I found a website that said 22. Then I found another one that I thought should be in there, so I lumped it in. So let's just say 23. Okay, here I'm going to show you a, another pie chart right now. It's really, really exciting. The kingdom of heaven is like. So of the parables, 78% of them are work-related. That's the analogy. 78% of the time when Jesus uses an analogy to help us understand what the kingdom of heaven is like, he uses work-related imagery to shape our thinking. So is it entirely accurate to say that the kingdom of heaven, the kingdom of God, is not a business? Let's look into that today. Some of you are feeling agitated already. What's, what's he going to say? Is it, where is this going? Let's, let's find out. I find this incredibly exciting. Now, here, here's what I mean by this. Here's what I mean by this. So many of these parables start like this. The kingdom of heaven is like a merchant. The kingdom of heaven is like a landowner. The kingdom of heaven is like a farmer. Not a gardener, a farmer. Remember, this is an agrarian society. This is his livelihood, right? The kingdom of heaven is like a, a money lender. The kingdom of heaven is like someone who went out and bought real estate. The, the kingdom of heaven is like, the kingdom of heaven is like over and over and over again. So how is it that we've said, yeah, not nah, Jesus, sorry, man, your kingdom isn't about all that. We don't do that in here. How, how is it that we do that? I have really good news for you today. <laughs> when Jesus, when Jesus, how many of you know the story where, where Jesus was little, he was like 12 years old, he wandered off from his parents in Jerusalem, they couldn't find him anywhere, right? They're looking high and low, where's Jesus? Have you ever lost your kids? Ever lost them on purpose? <laughs> Jesus was too good for that, I'm sure. But, but so, so they, they finally find him, where is he? He's in the temple. They go, where have you been? What did he say? I was just about my father's, huh, business. Father's got business. How many of you know these scriptures? There's, there's places in the Bible, we spiritualize them so bad that we, we miss the immediate application. So remember in, in Jesus' day, right? So if your dad is a metalsmith, what are you? A metalsmith. How do you learn how to do that from your dad? How do you do it? You, you imitate what your dad is doing. So when Jesus says, hey, I only do what I see my father doing, he's using work language. He's saying, I'm carrying on the family business. I'm carrying on the family name. My father's at work in the world, and I too am working. Your work life matters. And Jesus saw his kingdom as a matter of work. And I don't mean toil and drudgery, but I mean it's our, it's our vocation. It's, it's, what, it's what we're here to do. This is so exciting. So today you have the opportunity to wrestle with how to take that 55 or 60 or whatever percent of your life and go, maybe this does fit into whatever else God is doing in my life. What would it be like to bring those things together? Now, if we don't do this, if we don't acknowledge that God has a, has a plan for, for your business, for, for your work, for your school, remember that's your job if, you, if you're still in school, if we, once we realize that and we don't do anything with it, here's what happens. <laughs> you get Hollywood. You, you understand, Christians love to, to look down their noses at Hollywood, the, the, the Hollywood elite, right? The, those, those, those liberals, those, those left-leaning, progressive. We, we do this thing, right? And, and we're like, oh, I can't believe their stance on, on, on abortion. I can't believe their stance on this and that. And they're just so out of touch with reality. But has it ever occurred to you that the reason it's that way is that generations ago, when the Hollywood scene was burgeoning, the church pulled out and said, that's evil, no touchy, no touchy. We don't do that. We don't, we don't even go bowling and roller skating, never mind movies. And so we pulled out of this, we pulled out of this thing, and now, generations later, we're shocked at how immoral it is. Well, we weren't in there. We're the salt and light of the earth, Jesus says. 
we made this. <laughs> Hollywood is what it is because Christians refuse to take up the calling that God has for us in that sphere. <sighs> Pretty passionate about this. Now, Jesus, in one of the parables that isn't about work, said this, the kingdom of heaven is like yeast that a woman worked into a ball of dough until it had worked its way all the way through this dough, this entire loaf. So God wants to work his kingdom into every aspect of your life, including and probably especially your work, your school. So let's talk about that. I'm going to unpack with the time that I have left a, a parable, that probably one of the, big, the biggies, right? This is the, this is the one some of you, even if you haven't gone to church, you may have heard this one. It's super important. And Jesus is, again, talking about business, the business of the kingdom. Again, remember as I'm reading this, he's using this analogy because he wants you to see his kingdom this way. Okay? So here it is. Again, because he's just listed like a bunch of parables making this kind of point. Again, the kingdom of heaven will be like a man going on a journey, business trip, who called his servants and trusted his wealth to them. If you're a business owner and you've ever tried to go on a business trip and you've got to leave, who's holding the fort? What are their responsibilities? This is what he's describing. He called his servants and trusted his wealth to them. To one he gave five bags of gold, to another two bags, and to another one bag, each according to his ability. Remember that. Each according to his ability. Then he went on his journey, and the man who had received the five bags of gold went at once and put his money to work and gained five bags more. 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 Okay. But the man who had received the one bag, oh, sorry, the one... So also the one with two bags of gold gained two more, and the one who had received one bag went off, dug a hole, and hid his master's money in the ground. Can you see where this is going? If you just read this for the first time, you're like, uh-oh. What's going to happen? Okay, the Titanic sinks, but watch. Okay, <laughs> after a long time, the master of those servants returned and settled accounts with them. The man who had received five bags of gold brought the other five. Master, he said, you entrusted me with five bags of gold. See, I've gained five more. And his master replied, well done, good and faithful servant. You've been faithful with few things. I'll put you in charge of many things now, right? Come and share your master's happiness. He's, he's thrilled with what the servant has done, with what he gave him. Well, the man with two bags of gold also came. Master, he said, you entrusted me with two bags of gold. See, I've gained two more. His master replied, well done, good and faithful servant. You've been faithful with a few things. I'll put you in charge of many things. Come, share in your master's happiness. Door number three. Then the man who'd received one bag of gold came. Master, he said, here's the thing, <laughs> right? Literally, you can see it. In his here's the thing. I knew that you're a hard man, harvesting where you've not sown, gathering where you've not scattered seeds, so I was afraid. And I went out and hid your gold in the ground. <laughs> right? But here it is. Look. Here's what belongs to you. No harm, no foul, right? I didn't lose it. Here it is. Now what happens? His master replied, you wicked, lazy servant. So you knew that I harvest where I haven't sown and gather where I haven't scattered seed? Well, then you should have put my money on deposit with the bank so that you, when I returned, I'd have received it back with interest. Like, it, like, like At least that, right? So watch this. Then, so take the bag of gold from him and give it to the one who has 10 bags. Why does he have 10? Because he earned five more. So, so the master settles accounts with them. 
but he doesn't say, thank you very much, I'll take the 10. He lets him keep the 10. Why? Because he wants him to keep investing it. So he's like, dude, go, man. You're doing a great job, right? For whoever has will be given more, and they'll have an abundance. Whoever does not have, even what they have will be taken from them and throw that worthless servant outside into the darkness where there'll be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Now, this last section in particular, and with any parable, don't read too literally into exactly what it's saying. He's, it's an analogy. But at the very least, we can look at this and say, how we view what God has entrusted to us is of critical importance. What we do with what God has entrusted to us is of critical importance. And it's apparently of critical importance that we understand the kingdom like this. Including, and especially, our work. How could we take a parable about work and not apply it to work? Well, let's just talk about my parenting first. Yeah, okay, let's do that. But let's do the obvious one. Let's just connect the obvious dots. Because again, it's a parable, parallel. You're supposed to see the connections here. This is what we're wrestling with. Now, I'm going to draw three truth bombs out of this passage really quick, and then I'm going I'm to bring it home. So here's the first one. Obvious. I know you got this. I'm just going to state the obvious. God entrusts us, every single one of us, if we belong to him, with his kingdom resources so we can invest them. <laughs> You're like, yeah, I know. No, no, no. We don't know. Which is why Jesus told another parable. I'm just going to do it. I'm going to do a flyby. How many of you have heard the prodigal son? The prodigal son is a story about a father who's very wealthy. He's got servants. He's got all kinds of cattle. He's got cash. And he, he's got this inheritance sitting there waiting for his sons. He's got two sons. The younger one says, hey, dad. Can I get my inheritance early? I'm just solely summarizing. So the, the father gives him the inheritance early, and the son goes off, runs off with the money, and spends it on, on prostitution and drugs and alcohol and all kinds of stuff, gambling, whatever, and, and trying to buy friends. And basically, he comes to this moment where he comes to his senses, because he's out of money, <laughs> and, he's, and he slinks back home, and he goes, you know what? I'd be better off just being one of my father's hired hands, his, his, one of his servants. But the big picture, guys, is that the prodigal son is about someone who received blessings from God and thought they were for himself. That's it. Like, we're, going, we're looking at him going, oh, I would never, I would never just go off and, and hire a prostitute and I wouldn't, I wouldn't do that kind of stuff. No, that's not the point. The point is he took the inheritance, which was supposed to be reinvested into the family business, and he took it and spent it on himself. So how many of us wait for God to bless us, bless me, bless me, bless me, bless me, and he finally blesses him, he goes, oh, thank you, and we keep it. And he's like, but <laughs> that was to invest. Like, yes, it's for you. You get to benefit from it while you're holding it, but I want you to give it away. That's why I gave it to you. Guys, God gives you grace so that you can give other people grace. He gives you love so that you can show other people love. He gives you wealth so that you can bless other people who are in need. He gives you peace so you can pass it on. He gives you truth so you can share it. He gives you friends so you can pull people in out of loneliness into a circle of community. He gives you this church so that we can use it to grow his kingdom. This is what he does. He gives you his resources not to keep, but to invest. So that's the first one. Second one, he expects a good return on his investments. <laughs> he expects a good return on his investments, and our excuses won't cut it. Okay, but here's the thing. Like I knew 
that you were like a, a hard man, I was scared of losing it, and the sun was in my eyes, and like it's a really not a good time with our kids and our family, and last year this thing happened with our business, and there's a downturn, and but you, you, got all, you got all these excuses, right? And he's like, stop. <laughs> some people get five, some people get two, some people get one, some people get half a one, but you got something, and that was to invest. And the excuses don't cut it. That's one of the basic principles that you can get out of this passage. Here's the cool one. <laughs> He'd rather you risk losing these resources than choosing not to use them. I'm glad it worked out for the guy who invested five and he got five more. I'm glad it worked out for the guy who invested two and got two more. But you understand that when you invest something, it may not come back. And the implication here isn't just that, hey, they're proud of what they got out of it. He's just proud that they used what he gave them. So there's no guarantee that what you sow into this, you're going to get immediately back, and you're going to see it, and it's going to be measurable, and you get to hold it up to God and go, look what I did, which isn't the point anyways. That's not the point. He's pleased that these guys went immediately, it says, and used what they got, put it, into, put it to work, it says, and then got, got this return. And here's, here's the cool thing. Do you know that if you're in Jesus, you have an inheritance coming in him? That we call that heaven, right? You got this inheritance, it's, it's piling up in heaven. Did you know that God has an inheritance too? Ephesians 1, I think it's 17, talks, or 17 to 19 in there, talks about the fact that our eyes would be opened. God wants to open our eyes to his glorious inheritance. Where is it? In the saints. In other words, he's given us part of his heavenly treasure, part of his heavenly resources, and his inheritance is what we do with that. Like, this is why these guys are so excited to give it back to the master, because they know this is for him. It's not for us. It's for him. I don't want to withhold anything from the one who didn't withhold anything from me. I want to learn to be one of God's good investments. <laughs> Here's the last one. I didn't put on here, but it came from that guy right over there. Jez, fairly new believer. He's been to church off and on throughout his life. Honestly, I'm just going to th throw you under the bus a little bit. Jez would self admit, I don't know much about the Bible yet, like I'm learning, right? So I, the reason I'm saying this, so cool. We're sitting around in our life group, which meets at the food court in Vivo um, from time to time, because we like to be around the people we're trying to reach. And we're studying this passage, okay? Now, I've read this passage. I've probably memorized it. I've, like, I, over and over again, Bible school. It's probably been in classes, courses. I've read books, like, all of this stuff. And Jez has the audacity to come up with this insight I've never heard before. <laughs> it was awesome. It actually stopped me, and I, I actually said, I have never heard that before. Sometimes it's the fresh eyes that see the coolest stuff, because you grew up in church, and you grew up with the Bible, you're kind of told what it says without actually reading what it says. So you, the suspense is killing you, isn't it? You're like, what do you see? Next week. No, it's okay. So, um, <laughs> no, um, so, so, so. What he says is, you know, it's interesting, and I'm not going to do it as cool as him because I don't have a cool accent like he does, but um, talk to him after. You'll see what I mean. You're like, oh, yeah. <laughs> okay. So um, he says, you know, it's interesting. We read this passage that one got five, one got two, one got one, each according to his ability. He says, and we immediately assume that the guy who got five had the most ability. He says, why do we think that? He says, you know, as a businessman, what I do is I take my best people and I put them on my most difficult opportunities, my most difficult problems. He says, I think the guy who got one had the most ability. Isn't that interesting? Now Jesus, in so many of these parables, takes our common conventions and flips them right on their head. 
over and over and over and over again. I think that's the best interpretation. But you know what that does? It actually changes the meaning in a profound way. Because if the guy with the most ability got the toughest project, because it's easy to make money if you get 10,000, make some money with $10,000, go. Or I give you a dollar. Which one's easy to make money with, right? So he's got this difficult project, but, but he, he, here's the cool thing. At the end of the day, the guy with the most ability freezes on the dollar or on the, on the one bag of gold and buries it Which means, this isn't about your ability. In fact, the parable actually says that. What, what got the king or this landowner the return on the investment? Does it say anywhere that the, the return they got was due to their ability? Nope. It says that they immediately took what the person, the landowner had given them and put it to work. What got the return wasn't ability, it was willingness to take risks with what they'd been given. Which means it doesn't matter when you, when you sit here, well, I only got two and he got five, and how come he got 350? Irrelevant. The fact is you've been given something, what are you doing with it? And are you willing to risk with what God has given you? In fact, you should know this, you will be held accountable for whether you risked with what God has given you. If your faith never takes you over the line of your fear, you're not faithing. This is what this guy did. He froze. Well, I don't know for sure if I can make this work with just a dollar. So he buries it, and the king says, eh, wrong. If he had bought four sticks of gum and tried to sell them and for 25 more cents, I would have been happy. Or just get, get some interest from the bank, 4% on it. Whatever, I don't care. Just do something with what I've given you. And you start with what you've got. And what did he say? When you're faithful with what you've got, what does he do? He gives you more. And he gives you more. But again, what's the more for? It's not, oh, thank you. It's so that you can invest more in his kingdom. And as you become more invested in his kingdom, oh my goodness, so the cool stuff starts happening. So your capacity, your capacity is not determined by your ability. It's determined by his, number one, but by your willingness to use what God's given you to expand his kingdom. That's where your capacity lies. <laughs> This is good news. This is really good news. Everybody in this room is sitting on a gold mine of potential that God can use if you're just willing to use it. I'm gonna close with this. Jesus has a pie chart. And it's not like the work life, home life, social life. He doesn't divide it like that. His is more like the pie I have eaten, pie I have not eaten. His pie looks like this. How much of your life you've given to me and how much of your life you have not yet given to me. That's what it boils down to. So folks, if you're anything like the average person, I'm, I'm assuming there's some average people in here, you probably haven't taken hold of your work life, which is, again, your school, whatever that is, too, you probably haven't said, God, this is yours. You probably pray about it and wrestle with it and kind of poke at it, but, but to come to a place of surrender saying, this is part of what you've given me, and I wanna, I wanna invest what you've given me for your glory. In other words, God wants his business, like the Father's business, to become your business so that your business becomes his business. You could say it, if that's too complicated, if you could say it this way, if God doesn't have your work, he doesn't have you. <laughs> Remember, that's 60% of your life, 40%, 50% of your life. If God doesn't have that, you can't say he's got you. That's huge. So here, it's really simple. As we start this series, really simple. It's just this. I want to challenge you 
to give your life to Jesus. And if you've been parceling it out and you've got this slice called work life, I'm going to ask you to lay that barrier down and just say, and the social life, and the, just go, I just have a life. And I'm tired of fragmenting my life. I'm tired of making excuses because that slice, by doing that, I can, I can insulate that from God and his kingdom. And then, then I can come to church and I can, in my spiritual life, then I can really focus. I'm challenging you to knock all of that down because the best pie just kind of runs together anyway. So just let it all be a pie. Just let Jesus have your life. And if you need to name it, name it. Go, Jesus, I give you my work life so that you can integrate it into my whole life and I want to see it as just one big sloppy mess. Yes. So the question is, are you willing to do that today? Are you willing to say, Jesus, take my work life and just make it part of my life. Have it, whatever it looks like, because I want to use what you've given me to build your kingdom. Are you willing to say that today? If you're willing to say that today, you need to tell him that. It's not enough to just go, yeah, good point, Brad. Where's the donuts? You need to tell him that. And and some of you, you need to do something to prove it. He's going to put something into your mind, whether it's talking to someone else, going, you know what? I was really challenged about that today. I'm making that commitment. You hold me accountable. For some of you, it might be getting on your knees as we sing and surrendering to him. It might be as we're taking communion in a minute, expressing, you gave your life for me, so I give my life to you. It could be as simple as that, but I'm telling you, don't just think it, do it. Don't fool yourself into thinking that thinking is the thing. You have You need to show him your faith. Faith looks like something, or it isn't faith. So, I'm not going to tell you what it is you need to do, because that's between you and him, but do something. If it means standing up and declaring out loud, I don't care what it is, just do it. Okay, I'm done.